This is the Gospel Feast series for those who want a little meat after their milk. It's time to feast on the Word. We are starting a new podcast with author and historian Reed Simonson, whose work in ancient studies is insightful and profoundly interesting, in some cases even groundbreaking, and frankly, it's rather addictive. He not only has an incredible way of explaining complex topics, he has the ability to explain them in a simple way. Reed, welcome. I'm glad to be here. This is going to be fun. Let's start our feast. I have a question for you. What would you say makes your lectures and writings on the Old Testament so different? Well, I appreciate that. I actually think that the breakthrough for me came when I realized that the Old Testament particularly was an Eastern book. And the the principles of thinking in it are Eastern thinking, and particularly ancient Eastern thinking. The problem is, is that since Alexander the Great, to be honest, we are a Western culture. And even, even the Jews today are Western. And so we read this Old Testament, and it's written for Eastern thinkers, and we are Western thinkers. And so some of it is not only confusing, but by the time we put it through our Western mind, we come away thinking we understand things and aren't really grasping what the book says. So in a sense, we haven't been raised or trained to think in the way these books were written. I think that's correct. And I actually think that's exactly what Nephi was saying when he was lamenting that his children didn't understand Isaiah and other things because they weren't raised, in a sense, in Jerusalem. That's kind of what he's hinting at. So Nephi would have been that bridge between the old world, Jewish way, Eastern way of thinking, and a new way of thinking. Well, it is the brilliance of the Book of Mormon, and I'm glad you mentioned it. I'd like to talk about that in a minute. Uh, The Book of Mormon does attempt, and rather successfully, to explain an Eastern gospel in a Western way. And it's brilliant. It really is for that reason. But in terms of the Old Testament, well, let me give you an example. What I've, what, what's really true about the Eastern thinking people, they really saw the world in terms of what could be sensed by the senses was real. And this is a change from Alexander. Aristotle and the great Western thinkers really believed that if you couldn't analyze something analytically, there wasn't any reality to it. And that's absolutely juxtaposed against the Eastern thinking, which if you can't find the sensual or emotional base behind reality, then it has no value. So then there's that burden that we have as we've been raised in a analytical, mathematical way of thinking, that things have to be quantified. Absolutely. And Eastern thinking isn't composed that way. No, not at all. In fact, their nouns are really almost more verbs in in this way. If I were to ask a Westerner, and I I do this when I sometimes teach these things, I'll ask, describe a pencil to me. Hmm. And they'll say, well, give me a shot. What would you say? I'd say uh, wood, um, long, maybe three or four inches, um, two different colors, sometimes yellow and and a little black tip. It's exactly what they say. And and, and it's a perfectly good explanation. That is what a pencil is. But it's pure Westernism. Mm. It's so much like Plato's concept of these ideas that there's a, a perfect model of something in the sky or away from us. And we have to create perfection here by trying to attempt to make the perfection of the item as it exists in our head. It's very, very Western. So if you were to ask an ancient Easterner, for example, to describe a pencil, he would say, it's my means of writing my love to my family. Hmm. And so in that sense, the pencil could be anything that accomplishes that goal. Yes, yes. And the fact that it's the accomplishment of the action and the way that action makes you think and feel is really the value to it. No, that's fascinating. That, that, that would take a uh, wholesale change in the way we view things in order well, to understand. I, I agree. And it, it's actually what makes some of the Old Testament so difficult because they actually think that way. And, and we're looking at it and we're seeing the pencils as wood and they're seeing them as an aspect or a tool of love. Well, that's interesting. So you mentioned you mentioned Nephi and the Book of Mormon. It's kind of an example of 
bridging or, or beginning our tutorial in understanding Eastern thinking? Are there other, other resources out there? Well, there are, but in terms of the Book of Mormon, I'd love to share one particular one with you. Absolutely. I am astounded. Um, as I was studying Easternisms and getting my mind around this, I had, was also reading the Book of Mormon uh, because I love that book, and I bumped into Alma, and I realized how brilliant his famous lecture on faith is in, in the fact that it literally attempts to bridge Eastern and Westernisms in a sermon. And incidentally, most people don't know that Alma actually got that sermon from King David, which would be really fun to share with you all sometime. But that's Okay, a... well, you know what? We're going to be doing more of these, so we'll, we'll chalk that up for another one. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, if you go to um, Alma, uh, particularly in chapter 32, that famous one, it's really interesting. Uh, let's just kind of look at it together. Absolutely. Uh, in Alma 32, and we'll jump around a bit, but let's go to 27. He says, Behold, if ye will awake and arouse your faculties, even to an experiment upon my words, and exercise a particle of faith, yea, even if ye can no more than desire to believe, let this desire work in you until you believe in a manner that ye can give place to a portion of my words. It's astounding. It's brilliant. What you'll notice right away is Alma's using words like awake. So, I mean, open your eyes. He uses words like exercise, physical movement. He uses desire, which is an emotion. And he uses words like look in you and give place. These type of words. This is very, very Jewish. Now, consider, for example, in, in Western thinking, we can talk about emotions in abstraction. So, for example... You and I, as Westerners, can talk about anger, mm. and we can talk about the need for anger management. Yes. And we can talk about anger as though it, you know, is next door in some, some sort of a glass building, and it's, it's this thing, anger. To the ancient Jews, anger was the same as saying one flares their nose. So next time you get upset or, you know, you're mad at your spouse for, you know, leaving hair in the tub or whatever, and you're going to go tell them, your nose flares. When you get upset, you raise your nose and it flares. Well, so, even animals. I was just thinking about that. You know, it's, it's a visual cue in animals as well. And so that would be interesting because it's, it's taking an emotion and making it personal. That's right. That's exactly right. It becomes sensual. That's exactly their point. So with, with that in mind, and I, I would like to slide back to Alma, but just considering this thought that, that's going through your head, consider something the Lord says in the Doctrine and Covenants, because he walks easily through Westerns and Eastern, and he, he sees it all, but he was raised in Eastern thinking. And so you see clues of it when he's really trying to talk to you, you know. Uh, in Doctrine and Covenants 13351, there's a really interesting scripture that we sometimes read too fast. But with this idea of, of, of emotions being real and being valuable, listen to what he says. He, he's talking about his frustration and what it was like living amongst his people who didn't want him. And this is what he says. It's extremely insightful. And I have trampled them in my fury, and I did tread upon them in mine anger, and their blood have I sprinkled upon my garments, and stained all my raiment. For this was the day of vengeance, which was in my heart. So in the sense, he's saying, this is what was in my heart, my mind. This is what I was thinking. Well, or feeling. Or feeling, more specifically, yeah, with reference to the heart. With that not actually having happened. But yes. He was describing to us in minute detail the, I guess, rage is almost the word for it. Yes. It's a fascinating insight in that we see him as, as the wonderful, peaceful example that he was. But inside, he was deeply hurt by the way he was being treated, and he was very upset. And he kind of apparently said in his heart to himself, I will have my day of vengeance for, for the evil that I'm seeing all around here, but this isn't the time for that. And he felt the need, too, to give us the insight in that scripture. He very well could have kept that buried to himself. Yes, yes. But giving us that insight into his own personal psyche and how he could overcome that, even yes. though it was that intense. I mean, you read that again with that mindset. If I was to take that thought into my mind of this is what I would do to the people I love that mistreated me, 
I would have to be very mad. Well, sure. Now, let's play the Eastern card because you're, you're doing great, but this is a perfect example the way you've explained it. Take it for a moment and don't think about it in terms of thought, but think about it in terms of the feeling of the description. So for example, oh. what would it feel like in your heart to be so upset that you trample, that you actually take your feet and you trample and you tread in anger and to take the blood of what you've trampled and actually put it on your clothes how would that feel? Sticky, and, and as it dried, it would be crunchy, and it would be uncomfortable. What would it look like? And as you're wearing it, what would it smell like? That's the Eastern idea. If you can get your mind around that type of an emotion, that is real in the Jewish way. We kind of dismiss it. We say, oh, it's just the way you feel. Just get over it. Because they really felt it, it was real. That's the major difference. So with that wonderful question you asked, Let's go back to Alma for just a minute, because mm. it's a perfect segue. Thank you. If we look at verse 28 of that same chapter, Alma now says this, and it's so Western and Eastern. I, I was really deeply impressed when I, when I read it. It's like they really did get our day, just as they said. Now, we will compare the word. Okay, that's the thinking part, but we're going to compare it to a seed. Now, if you give place that a seed may be planted in your heart, Behold, if it be a true seed or a good seed, if you do not cast it out by your unbelief. We're not thinking about this seed. We're going yeah, to okay. analytically destroy this seed. <laughs> no, don't do it. Put it in your heart. Okay. Yeah, don't, don't think about it. Leave it there. Yeah, that's and right. And feel what it does. Yes, now you've got it. Now, now, this is what he says. Now, just follow this. It's really incredible. Behold, it will begin to swell within your breast. That's a feeling. That's a feeling. And then you will feel the swelling motions when you feel the actual swelling inside. It's real, he's saying. The feeling is real. You will begin to say within yourself, it must needs be that this is a good seed, for that the word is good, for it beginneth to enlarge my soul. It's real to him. So, it, yeah, it's, it's not that, um, no, and that's, I like it. It's not that I've been given more information. It's not that I've learned new things. It's that I'm having an experience exactly that right. can't be described other than it's enlarging me. It's exactly right. And to the Easterners, that is reality. And that's what he's saying. This is real. That makes it real. Um, for us, we would probably again view it as, oh, I've learned more. Sure, sure, <laughs> sure. And I guess you've learned because it, 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 it is still a type of learning. Right? It is but, a type of but learning. But it's not, it's not, again, we're, we're very analytical people. And so we think, okay, I've, I've A plus B equals C. I've now, I've now learned C. Exactly. And that's not the point of that. Well, and when you start to get your mind around these things, you do remember that one of the things that the Book of Mormon warns of, and even in talking about Lucifer, says that they believe they will be heard for their much speaking. Ah. <laughs> and it does remind you of a debate. It's just like the war in heaven. Here you've got the father saying, I can't really explain this to you other than you need to go through it. And you've got Lucifer saying, we didn't need it here. We don't need it later. I don't need any of this stuff because I don't understand it. And they had a debate in some ways and maybe a war for all we know. Yeah. And after much talking, a significant number of people yes. believed the falsehood. Doesn't it make you think of Korahor a little bit too? Mm. Interesting, The more huh? he talked, the more he had uh, followers. Yes. One of the brilliant things for me, I do remember when I got my own testimony of the Book of Mormon. Mm. And it went just the way I was told to. I, I read the book and then I trusted Moroni. I had an open mind, an open heart, and I went and asked and I got my own witness of it. And... That was something that happened within me. It's like mm -hmm. the good swelling seed. Yeah. I can't deny it. And even when perhaps at times I wasn't all that good at explaining my testimony in the mission field or other places, I, you know, you're not always quite able to say it. Nobody could take it from me because it was an experience and a feeling and it was real. That's one of the secrets. Mm. If, if readers can get their mind around this concept and there's a few other Easterners that we can certainly share with people, but this is really the core of it. They will see the Old Testament open in ways that they didn't imagine it could. Just thinking about that, having read um, the first book in your series, you do spend a great deal of time uh, trying to help tutorial and discuss practicing Eastern thinking. 
Oh, yes. I think it's huge. I think it's huge. And I, um, each of the books does try, and I think they all do, in fact, have a specific lesson on trying to think more Easternly. And, is, and, and that is the preparation then for the rest of the book to then tackle the very you know, difficult concepts that are found in the Old and New Testament at times. Well, I, I really believe that when a person gets their mind around Easternisms and can start thinking the way that we'll talk about some more, books like Isaiah are not hard. Mm. You know, I, I have never heard that said to me before. There are books <laughs> like Isaiah are not hard. I have, I have had seminary teachers and I don't know how many different, different uh, uh, Sunday school lessons and, and theological discussions with people of all denominations and they think they can wrap their mind around Isaiah, but there's passages they just can't explain. They, they are overthinking it. It flows into you. And as you start to apply some Eastern ideas, and there's some others, like I say, this is the core. There's more. We can, we can certainly share them. Um, in fact, I hope people will want to know it. But it flows inside, and you find yourself going, I get it. I get it. You know, speaking of difficult books to understand, or at least parts that are difficult to understand... The book of Daniel has some passages, chapters, that can be rather difficult. Very true. Um, now, I have heard you tell people that it is one of the most important books in all of Scripture. Well, thank you. It's actually not me that said it. Believe it or not, it was Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton? It was. <laughs> I've got to hear more about this. Well, it, it's kind of shocking when you really stop and think about what he said and how he said it, because it's it's kind of goofy, and yet... You know, this is Isaac Newton. This is the guy that invented calculus. Oh, yeah. He, he's the father of modern mathematics. He invented it. I mean, I don't know. Gosh, how do you invent math? You know, but I mean, he invented calculus and we're still using it now. He actually said something really interesting. He said, he who denies Daniel's prophecies undermines Christianity. This is an Old Testament book. He who denies Daniel's prophecies undermines Christianity, which is founded... Christianity, which is founded on Daniel's prophecies concerning Christ. You know, that's fascinating because most people read Daniel for, I guess, its historical, you know, context of the, the captivity of Israel and Babylon and, and, and a lot of what well, they're Well, in the story, through. there's some good stories in there. I mean, yes. the lion's den is a yeah, pretty well, cool that's, story. That's most what, yeah, that most people, they'll bring that up. And, uh, and, you know, the crazy interactions with, with King Nebuchadnezzar. But really, Christianity has foundations in the book of Daniel. Well, he's almost saying that if Daniel's wrong, Christianity's wrong. And that's mind-blowing. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure he had something to back that up. I mean, this is... Well, he, he did. Um, Isaac was a fascinating man. What most people don't know about him, actually, he had a quest. He believed the Bible was true. He believed well, it was the word start. of God. Yeah, true, true. And he believed that with his mathematical and chemical minds and, and his brilliance as a scientist, he was actually trying to create a philosopher's stone, as he would say. Now, interestingly enough, we think about Harry Potter and his sorcerer, gonna, philosopher's say, stone. Just, you, know? you know, magic and wizards and, and all that silliness. But uh, he was actually trying to make some kind of tool he to was. aid himself. He was. It was a stone of light and knowledge. He oh. wanted a stone of light and knowledge. You Where know, have you we, heard this I have, before? I have heard that defined by another funny word, urimum and thummum. Yes. <laughs> he believed it was possible to make one. It's interesting, and we could study that some more and talk about Urim and Thummim some more at some point, but he was going to make one. Now, he ended up failing at this. Okay. But in his quest to make one and in his quest to really understand the scriptures, he wanted one so he could understand the scriptures even deeper, and he worked at it ferociously. I mean, he really, his records and um, journals in these regards are becoming available slowly, and they are astounding. It's because of him that we are able to better chart prophetic time. It's because of him. Okay. Yes, his mathematical works. But perhaps the most interesting thing, he became convinced that he could not predict the exact time of the Lord's second coming any sooner than 2060. And he did that mathematically, I assume. He did. Using the scriptures. He did. He did. And if he had been able to get his philosopher's stone, he was going <laughs> to do, in a sense, what Joseph Smith did and look at the Bible through it. He was convinced that was the answer. He failed in both accounts. It's interesting because if you do study his life, you'll find that as he's actively trying to do this, his dress is humble. His demeanor is humble. He's very 
much a man trying to be humble and approach God in a way that he can get an answer. And God gave him all kinds of beautiful laws and lessons. I mean, there's no question, I think, that the Lord didn't touch his mind because of his humility. When he realized he would not live to see the second coming Mm. and that he was not going to be able to make a sorcerer's stone, he maintained his Christianity, but he went and bought some flamboyant clothes. Oh, He bought a fabulous wig. Okay. And he kind of became a well-dressed member of the Royal Society. He just sort of found a way to enjoy his wealth and prosperity. He did. He realized that he it wasn't going to be in his lifetime. Okay. And so he didn't need to wear rags and be a Puritan and necessarily, you know, be humble every second in case the Lord showed up. He realized it wasn't going to happen any time during his life. But uh, back to your bigger question. In breaking through to Daniel, mm. he discovered that Daniel included timetables that were huge. And because we can prove that Daniel predates Christianity and that the records of Daniel existed before the Lord's birth, Daniel gives us some exact specifics as to when the Lord would show up and also something even more astounding to restore Christianity. He also gives some clues as to Joseph Smith. Oh, that's fascinating. You know, we'll need to... Do you do you discuss this more fully? I do, I do. It's actually in um, the first book in the Gospel Feast series that I wrote, which... I've been giving lectures about this, and and um, people wanted more. And you can only give so much in a in a lecture. I completely understand. And I really wanted to break it down and show some of Isaac Newton's thinking, some of thinkings of other great people that also followed in his footsteps, as well as literally illuminating some of the chapters that are astounding that we kind of skip in church and in Sunday school classes because they're confusing. They're really not that confusing when you have a few keys. And again, some Eastern thinking really helps. I should say, in the first volume of the Gospel Feast series, uh, Daniel in the Last Days, every single verse in Daniel's book is in there. And there is commentary and explanation, I think, in, in, in an entertaining way. Well, that makes it better to read as well. So where can people find your book, Daniel and the Last Days? Oh, thank you. Um, It is available at retailers. Amazon has it, which is probably the easiest. But we've also made it available for free as part of Kindle Unlimited. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay. And then this is the first book, I understand, in the Gospel Feast series. How many books are there currently? I believe there's 18 if you add all of the supplemental studies. Okay. The books actually build on each other. may not feel that way when you look at the titles, but they actually do. The first book is on Daniel in the last days, and it's crucial to understand it. As Isaac Newton said, Christianity rises or falls on it. So it's the place to begin. It really is. And and you can you know start with any volume, but I, I think if you start there, you'll see that books do build on each other. And you'll gain more, I think, if you start at the beginning. The second one is actually on Jonah. And what's astounding about Jonah, Jonah is a Mormon book. Oh, that's a, that's a bold statement. It is, it is. And I know that today we would say, I, I've actually been finding myself more and more trying to be obedient to the mandate that we have to try and use Mormon less, uh, which I understand. I've been trying to use restored Christianity more mm. because I really like it. If you understand that... And it's more accurate a description. I think it is. So to be honest, um, now I would probably say Jonah is a restored Christian book. But my friends that are coming from outside of Mormonism still have that as part of the term they use to describe those that are LDS. Well, and it gets their attention because they'll say Jonah's not a Mormon book. The Book of Mormon's a Mormon book. Ah, but Jonah's a Mormon book. And it really is uh, astounding how the Book of Jonah proves and preaches the gospel of the restoration and Joseph Smith in ways, if you don't understand the restored gospel, you do not understand Jonah. And by the time people are done, they have to admit that's true. Oh, that's fascinating. More depth on that. We need to hear more about that. Absolutely. You know, I think we are running a little bit short on time. I advise everyone listening and all the the people that are out there to read and learn and study the gospel to read this series in the order because they build on each other, as Reed has been telling us. And particularly remember to focus on those chapters about Eastern thinking. That will help you wrap your mind around some of these formerly difficult concepts that actually shouldn't be. 
Let's see, there's one book that has actually apparently caused people a little bit of stress. It's volume number five on Ezekiel. And so uh, he did write, uh, Reed has told me he's wrote a truncated version. And so it's called Essential Ezekiel is what, is what you're telling me. So it is, a, actually I've been told Ezekiel is considered the toughest book in the Bible. Um, so if you can conquer Ezekiel, uh, you could probably easily master Isaiah. Is that what you're telling me? Okay. We should probably give people just one quick reminder where they can get and uh, follow along as we go through the Gospel Feast series. So again, uh, the books are available on Amazon. You just need to search for, uh, what do we search for? It's under the Gospel Feast series or certainly read R. Simonson. Okay, so yes, Gospel Feast, Feast series, read R. Simonson. That has been our discussion for today. I'd like to remind everyone that the feast that is the gospel of Jesus Christ is free to all. It is universal and it is eternal. And we invite everyone to come and feast at the table of the Lord. And we'd like to remind people too, this podcast is our understanding of the gospel and it is ours alone. We are not endorsed or reviewed by any denomination. But again, the gospel is free to all and we invite all to come sup with us and thank you, and we will see you on our next podcast.